Thank you very much. You. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate you coming. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So I had a bunch of questions to ask you, and then I saw the news that came out on Monday about your sales dropping, I think the biggest drop in a decade. So I thought I would just start with that, just to break the ice. <laughs> What's going on? This could be a long half hour, this one, isn't it? Um, you know the rules, keep it short. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, tr trading trading's a little challenge, that's for sure. And yeah, we've got probably three or four of our larger markets that are all kind of misstepping at the same time, which when you consolidate the numbers up means the business is under pressure. So, uh, and you know, none more so than here in our home territory here in the US. So there's plenty of urgency in the business. Yeah, we've got some uh, confident plans about what we're going to do with the business, but in the, in the interim period, it's, uh, it's a challenging environment. Challenging indeed. Uh, so let me read something more specific. Fox News reported, quote, McDonald's has said it's planning fundamental changes to its business to combat its recent weak performance, seeking to eliminate layers of management and creating new organizational structures, blah, 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 to better respond to consumer taste. That was my favorite part of the quote. So what else is going on? Yeah, I mean, you, you approach, effectively what's the turnaround situation with so many different angles. I mean, you've got to get your structure right, you've got to get the teams right and the talent right. You've also got to get your strategy and, and get those plans into action. And I think uh, the reality for the business and something that we recognize is if the pace of change outside is a little quicker than the pace of change within, it does get caught. And I think that's been a situation we, we've got to front up to and acknowledge, which then means you start to add there's a, there is, it's incumbent on us now to have some pace and some energy in the business. So you'll start to see this cadence of activity and energy across the business, both from a strategic level, but also tangible action in the marketplace, which, frankly, unless customers care about it, it's not going to resonate. So it's got to be consumer basic, which is, is where our focus is. Yeah, sounds good. So let's talk about your next generation digital workforce. And um, you have been. Uh, since you came back and done some uh, amazing things. I don't think the audience knows here, but this guy was doing uh, great. He had uh, two separate CEO jobs in, in the UK, um, jobs that I call where you're large and in charge, and uh, it's your company. Uh, Pizza Express, you were the CEO there, then you moved on to Wagamama, which most people don't know, but it's a very trendy uh, restaurant chain out of the UK. So why did you decide to come back to McDonald's, this huge company? that serves 70 million people a day and 35,000 locations, I think it is, across 100 countries mm -hmm. per day. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to come back to McDonald's? Yes, it's good. I get asked the question a fair bit, particularly when you get trading results like yesterday's. But um, both, both the businesses I, I ran in the UK were, were great fun, great brands, great businesses, and were exciting grow-out potential. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, but I had seen, I clearly kept in touch with McDonald's. Having spent, uh, just so people know, 17 years at McDonald's before I met, um, I could see the situation the business was getting into, and we were into that situation where when you get an invitation to come back and be part of a team that starts to become, if you like, the architect of the next generation of growth, when you get an opportunity of a business the size and scale of McDonald's, that's incredibly attractive. It, it, there are very, very many people who just, when opportunities come like that, you've just got to grasp it. And that, and that was my, my perception was we'd had a wonderful time through the 2000s, 2000s, and probably by about 2011, things began to slow down, plateau, and then just begun to decline. And uh, yeah, to get a shot at being part of the team and to start to get the business on track and really deliver meaningful growth for the next generation is kind of a once in a lifetime shot. It's just one you just you struggle to turn down. Yeah, I love it. Um... So let's go and talk about your folks. The, you've made some you know, pretty big moves, brought in some pretty cool people, pretty high power people on the digital side. How are you going to tap into the, both the entrepreneurial movement and the technology movement, both here in Chicago as well as in Silicon Valley? What's, what's the strategy there? Yeah, well, one of the attractions are coming back, and um, Don Thompson runs the business. Many of you may know Don, he's the chief exec. And uh, when, when he said to come back, he said running the global brand role is marketing, mainly consumer business insights. And I wanted to run the digital team. So I said to him, I didn't know we had one when I left. He goes, well, we haven't. I want you to start one. I thought, oh, geez, what do I know? So you, you start hiring employee number one. So we, one of the a huge attractions and one of the energizers for our business is, and, and you've got to picture this, in a huge business, 1.8 million staff around the world, 59 years in existence, somewhat slow moving, risk averse business. We have now embedded a standalone digital structure right in the heart of that business. 
And um, that to me is going to be an opportunity for the change agents and the innovators and the risk takers and to add a new pace and energy and dynamic to our business. But with regard to talent, um, we need a certain amount of talent at the core, out in the corporate HQ in Oakbrook, to set the tone of the culture. Didn't, uh, didn't I hear a rumor that you might be opening up an office in Chicago or something? Is that, is that true? Um, it is a rumor, and it's also true. Um, <laughs> So we one of the, one of the yeah one of the early decisions we made was we 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 want we believe we had to grow the the, the, the core organisation out of Oakbrook to change the culture help us change the culture but we also opened an office in San Francisco partly because um, that's where a lot of the talent is and partly because that's where a lot of the, the the partners and the business development work and, 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 and the design work goes on but also here in our own backyard. I mean, Chicago is an innovative, fun, dynamic city, and we wanted to be able to call upon the talent available in this marketplace as well. So um, we will be opening in the first quarter of next year our first downtown presence, and we will be using it to help build out both our, our digital team for the US business, but also helping to attract talent into our corporate team as well. Wow, that's exciting. It is, it is. We, we know the space and uh, it's ready to move into. We, we will be working out of it um, by the end of the first quarter. Can I host one of these events there, maybe? Because we're, we're growing out of this space, too. <laughs> as long as you can find someone to buy the beers for us, yeah, we're good. We're pretty good at that, actually. Um, so, and, and you hired a key Silicon Valley leader to kind of head up your digital strategy, your number two guy. That seemed like a brilliant move. Yes, I mean, uh, the idea on, on this was, if you're going to go into something, you're going to go large. I mean, for it, to, to, for it to make a meaningful difference, really for our customers, but also to our business, you can't tiptoe around the fringes on this one. You've really got to have intent. And, and in fairness to the leadership team of God and the board as well, we have put substantial resource behind this, both financial resource, but knowing that you need human resource as well to support that. So we hired a guy called Atif Rafiq, um, who had worked in some startup businesses as well as AOL, Yahoo, and, and most recently came out of Amazon and really run the, the Kindle project for Amazon as well. So he has a huge I mean, experience and knowledge, but also a convening power where you know, he, he has a contact book, which has been very, very helpful. And we've we started to build both global teams, our areas of the world, and the market. And, and from him literally being employee number one of, in October last year, we, by the end of 2015, we're looking to have somewhere between 200 to 250 in just our core digital team alone. So we have a significant intent behind this. And that's, that's impressive. Money where your mouth is. Can, can we switch to platform a little bit and talk about what's going on there? Um, I hate to keep beating you up, but Fortune magazine, they, uh, I was coming back from the UK on Thanksgiving, actually, and I think the mini cover story was Mc, McDonald's, the... Uh, uh, Stand by. Uh, the cover story was the McDonald's, the fallen arches. I thought, well, that's a bit of a cheap shot. And then I read the article. It's pretty much what we're talking about now. But the, you know, it was an early, early indication. But um, you know, having done a few turnarounds myself, I, I ask this very, you know, compassionately. Really, is and, and, but, but I'm really just curious. I mean, are they using the T, the T word in Oakbrook? Yeah, I think. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, at a point in time, you got to realize that. A trend, a series of results becomes a trend, which you then have to actively reverse rather than just a just a blip or something like that. And you know, the reality is that we've got nine quarters of decline in, in terms of just life, life sales and, and income. So you know, that becomes a, a meaningful trend. And, and for some of us, I have an experience of it back in the UK. I mean, part of the experience I, I, I hope to try and bring the team here was. UK hits a pretty sticky spot around 03, 04, 05, and um, I was fortunate enough to lead a team that, that really got the business turned around and moving. You have to act differently in a turnaround situation, and the first thing you've got to do is call it. Yeah, just calling it alone is... Uh, in 2009, then the Chief of Staff then, Rahm Emanuel, said something to the effect like... Um, actually, it was criticized for saying, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. But it does allow you to do things that you yeah. thought you could never do. So yeah. are you seizing this crisis? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the sort of language that I use and encourage those around me to use is when you're in a turnaround situation, you can't incrementalize your way out of it. You know, if you're going through a nice growth phase and you just want that continuous improvement, nothing wrong with that, you keep it going. But when you're in a turnaround, you need to really pivot. You need to have some some real points of meaningful change, both within the business, but you know, frankly, from a, from a consumer point of view. So, and that involves taking risks, 
you know, we, we are typically a risk-averse company, a very methodic and, and thoughtful um, and thorough in the way we do it. But time doesn't allow you to do that when you turn around. So we were trying to add some pace, add some um, agility to the business, and you know, I'm trying to use the phrase progress over perfection. Not everything has to be 100% right. Get it out there, get in front of consumers, they'll give you some very quick feedback, and if you're smart enough to listen and adapt and work, then uh, you get rewarded by it. I was going to ask you what, what lessons you learned when you did the turnaround in the UK, but something I just, I just heard then. Um, yes, I mean, it's some of the things that are going on here in our US business, where you want, you want to get the structure, point in the right way, you know, over time, particularly over a successful period, just size starts to build up and some bulk builds up in the business and a little bit of bureaucracy and there's always good reasons for all of that, but sometimes you just need to take a, take a little bit of a scalpel to it and, and tidy things up. So, um, so we've delayed the management, uh, the, the, the overall organizational structure here in the US business, such a, it was a three layer, but from corporate and some di three divisions and then there were 22 regions. With that divisional layer has been taken out just to speed decision making and empower the regions to make and to take some a greater accountability, but also have more responsibility to building their plans to benefit their customers. So uh, um, we had very similar experience in the UK, which was it was it was around adding pace such that consumers can see you're a business on the move. Something's happening at McDonald's. Make yourself interesting again, and that's what we're fighting. Interesting and relevant, right? So let's focus on the consumer. Then you mentioned words like transparency, customization. Um, new customer experience, are those core to the uh, transformation? Yeah, I mean, those are, I mean, so much of that is, is our societal strengths and, and expectations that consumers have of businesses generally. I mean, most figures in authority have a lower level of trust than they had 10, 15 years ago. I mean, within business, particularly in the financial community, le levels of trust have dropped. In politicians, levels of trust. In authority figures like the police, levels of trust have dropped. So. Consumers are beginning to see their peer group as that point of reference. Family and friends is, is the point of reference. And that means we've got to present ourselves in a very different way. We can't be a mass marketer that just pushes the message out and expects people to A, care, B, listen, and then, then C, change behavior. So we have to really adapt the way that we organize ourselves and think about attracting customers and being meaningful and purposeful in their lives. And transparency is a big piece of that. You know, at the moment, you know, we can be seen, like most business, big businesses, as a somewhat faceless, big organisation, and that doesn't imbue great levels of trust. So, you know, there are things we're doing now which uh, we believe are opening ourselves up, having people take take a good close look at us, ask us questions, be more humble about it, and uh, and, and just just resonate in a more meaningful way. And you had the guts to actually do an ad about this. Ask questions. <laughs> yeah, so we've launched a, a website here in the US, and it's around food. I mean, a lot of the questions around the business, around the food. That, that's where we're going next. Okay. Um, Everybody wants to hear about the menu. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm glad because if they don't, and there's a restaurant business, we're in trouble. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we, we've launched a website here in the US, which has been um, very successful in attracting um, just consumers. Uh, interest elsewhere around the world called Our Food Your Questions, where you know, customers are, are encouraged, or sorry, members of the public are encouraged, just ask us any questions you want, and we'll go on the record, respond, and it will stay on the record. And, and the levels of interaction, we've got 15, 20,000 questions, we put one or two videos on there around how our food's prepared and how it gets from farm through to the restaurant had over 10 million views on YouTube. So we, we're onto something that, that is, is spiking people's interest. And, and uh, I guess what we really want is people to be able to have an impression of McDonald's that's based upon just the facts as opposed to just the ESA. And, uh, and, and you know, not everyone's going to support that, not everyone's going to fall in love with that, but at least they're going to be able to form an impression based on, on the reality. And everyone knows here, a lot of big corporations talk about transparency, and it's like, wah, 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 you know, whatever. Um, you guys had the guts to put, so if anyone hasn't been to the website, go and watch people ask these questions, and they actually answer them. Like, is there really beef in the beef patties? I mean, they're very, you know, core questions that people actually have in their mind. Yeah, that's one of the Plyto questions. You should read some of the others. And, uh, well, this is a PG program. <laughs> but no, I mean, the, the, the reality is the urban myths circle as well, and suddenly the myths become reality. So, I mean, this was just about laying yourselves open and just... The conversation happens anyway, regardless of whether we're involved or not. 
So we might as well just get involved and be just be conversational, be approachable about it, and just just play our part in in, in, in just the conversation that we're already having. Yeah, exactly. So let's shift to what everyone wants to hear about the menu. What are you doing to attract millennials to uh, engage with them? But really, let's stick with the menu. You know, what what do they want to eat, and what are you going to do? Yeah, well, it, it, first of all, <laughs> we serve a lot of millennials, so that, that, that there would be a convenient. Um, uh, impression given that they're all running off to fast casual and, and, and suddenly that they, they deserted McDonald's. That, that's absolutely not the case. So, however, can we play a more meaningful role, uh, rather more functional role? The answer is yes, we can. Um, and I guess for about 59 years, we have typically asked customers to fit around our business model. Here's our menu, and here's the way that you can interact with us, but the sort of experience with us. You've trained us, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, and with huge amounts of success around the world. It's enabled us to get into 118 countries with a model that typically works and enables us to, to, to establish ourselves and then scale in, in markets around the world. But people, uh, people's um, desires are changing. They want to be treated as individuals, not as numbers, and therefore, Personalization, customization is becoming much more meaningful for us. So, you know, at the moment we're, um, we're, we're one of the areas around the future that we're building for McDonald's is around menu side, which is around uh, it's an initiative which we're calling Create Your Taste, and uh, or it's effectively a build your own burger type, where we highlight the, the real and fresh ingredients. It's customizable. We're introducing technology into that place. You walk into a restaurant, and there's a interact itself or the kiosk or a tablet of some form, create your own burger and then tell you what, just go take a seat, we'll bring it out to you. So it's a very different service experience, it's a different menu experience. If you want a Big Mac alongside that, absolutely, you're more than welcome. But it's just creating another range of choice and personalization that kind of is, is, is resonating more with where societal trends are going. Certainly millennial trends are going. So create your own taste. Um, I walk in, I hit, a, I hit a keypad, I can do chicken, I can do beef, I can order all the sides and new things that you've added. And is this just for millennials or can I go? Um, I'm getting hungry. I'm getting hungry. Even our more mature millennials like yourself can go as well. No, this is, yeah. so, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We actually have, uh, we have half a dozen test restaurants up around the US, but uh, just one locally, if anyone's out that way, it's, on, it's in Downers Grove. It's on Ogden, just, just off uh, 355, um, which is the first one we brought into, into, into the Chicagoland area. And we're, we're seeing all consumers interact with it. It definitely resonates well to millennials. It's absolutely what they're asking for, partly because then the word of mouth is traveling. We've only been up and running for a week, and the amount of referrals through friends and family and what have you, particularly through the millennial generations where the word, word of mouth uh, spreads. If you sit in a restaurant, you'll see a full range of spectrum of customers will be interacting with it, of course. So it's a big bet. It's one of them, yeah. yeah. That's good. Uh, so what, I forgot to ask, what's your favorite thing to order at McDonald's? Um, if, I've, if I've not visited for a few days, which for me is quite a long time away from the, from, from the food, I would go for a quarter pound of cheese. And yours? Mine? Oh, that's confidential. It's just, you know. I am a drive through guy, coffee and oatmeal. None of this stuff I'm talking about. Okay. I'm in the car a lot. Okay. It's embarrassing. Uh, good for you. Yeah, yeah. Extra napkins. <laughs> it's usually a mess. So that's one part of the experience menu. Let's talk about the actual restaurants. The consumer experience in the restaurants. Um, Atif has talked about this a little bit. What's the restaurant of the future look like for, for you? And then let's talk, touch on the industry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, again, uh, what we want to do is, 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 is effectively transfer the power of the experience into the hands of the customer rather than from us. And I think you know, for a long time we have dictated where either you come into the restaurant and you queue at the front counter in the way that we, we have designed, or else you go for the drive through. I would say in the next short period of time, two to three, four years, there'll be three, four, five different ways, further ways, of, of, of going through the entire McDonald's ordinary experience, whether it's the ordering and payment piece. So everything from self-order kiosk through to web ordering, mobile ordering, maybe ordering in advance, and as you pull on to the last through geolocation, we recognize you, and it fires the order off the kitchen, you pull into just a, a separate park-up bay, and we run it out to you. So, you know, as well as the, the core strengths of the service model, I, I can see us leveraging, allowing technology to do the heavy lifting, which gives customers more choice. 
And that last one was kind of a return to the drive-in versus the drive-through. Absolutely, yeah. No, almost how, how our heritage started before uh, we were on the first first businesses to actually put a drive-through lane around the building. But um, but, but, but the re the reason why technology allows you to is if you were say you've got a family of four in your car, you can actually put your order into your app first. So you don't you don't. There may not be almost any human interaction. It may not need to be. The millennials prefer that. I prefer that. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about the, uh, the, the human interaction piece, but in terms of just making it more seamless, just taking any of the stress points out of what should be a pretty simple experience. And you know, where we were probably as a business, one of the um, ultimate examples of convenience, as probably as recently as 10 years ago, the entire landscape around consumer convenience has just dramatically changed. And that has reframed the consumer's mind. So, but for instance, we, you know, as we went to debit credit card and cashless, for example, with just cash, we thought that was a step change in, in oh, but now with Apple Pay, for example, you know, we, we were launch partner with Apple Pay. That is again taking three or four steps or five steps out of the consumer experience, which just makes people's lives easier. Yeah, and you guys have always been kind of on the cutting edge of that. I remember when I first started using my credit card at McDonald's, like a cup of coffee for a buck. I thought this is embarrassing, and it was almost like people would rather take the cash. Now it's just the opposite. But we don't have cash. Just swipe, yeah, see, I mean, swipe something and get out of here. You always used to think that you would be for large ticket items, and therefore McDonald's would fit into that. And uh, you know, as we as we look around the world, certainly you're going to Scandinavia, where Technology and, and cashless is, is dominant. Probably 70 to 80% of our transactions okay. are cashless in one way, shape, or form. That's at McDonald's with our kind of lower average share compared to most. So, if that's a signal where society is going, then, then you know, we've got to make sure our technology and our system and our thinking is indicating that we're planning that way. I'm smiling because there's a few Kellogg students over here who were in the class where we did some confidential innovation work for you guys, and they're all over there taking credit for all these ideas. Because um, they had a drive through idea, uh, they had um, the uh, I'm saucing an idea, and so incrementally, they, I hope they gave you some inspiration. Um, but more importantly, where do you get your good ideas and your innovation? And the inspiration actually come up with these changes? Yeah, I think. We, we've had to be a little more open-minded. You know, for, for a long time, we, we generally, we generally um, crafted our own destiny, and with significant success over the years. But uh, as I say, with, with, with the pace of the world changing, we can't necessarily expect just internally to keep on top of that. So I think we're a more curious organisation, and we're, we're trying to attract more curious people who can help bring us, bring, bring us that, that kind of mindset. Um, but to answer it, from more established, but more, if you like, modernised, just plan consumer insight, planning processes, all the way through from interacting with partners who are beyond our sector and help indicate to us where the world's going. So we're much more interested in what's happening in transportation, what's happening in refrigeration, what's happening in agriculture. So it's not necessarily what your competitor do, doing down the road, although you never take your eye off that, but actually probably the guidance for the future which is likely to come from um, the revolution in, in, in taxes and Uber and transportation or drones than it is from just what you've cost Uber and that's a good better road. I'd like a Big Mac delivered to my house by a drone. That's my wish. If you're looking for ideas, I'm well, just saying that. Well, the, well, what, what, and, and, and in, in, to a degree of seriousness, what you're talking about is effectively a modernised delivery service. And it may not be someone on a moped or someone in a car with a sign on the top, but it may be, it's, 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 it's where is transportation going that we can leverage to provide another option and a benefit to the customer? I'll give you two examples of that. Today I was at a meeting at an unnamed company and we had to order lunch. And I said, why don't we order it from McDonald's because I'm going to talk to Steve tonight. But all the other ones had a delivery mechanism in them. It was like they didn't intuitively think of that because they would have killed to have some French fries. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I can give you loads of reasons why we don't. And that none of them are wrong. But that may be at, at a, in a, putting yourself in a juxtaposition where, where society is going. So basically, what you've got to do is unlock your mind and find out reasons for how, not reasons why you can, how you can, as opposed to for reasons why you can't. So it's, 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 the, it's moving from the yes but conversation to a yes and conversation. Yes, that's where it's going, and this is what we can do. This is how we can play. And frankly, if we can't solve something like that with the resources we have and the scale we have, then and that's a fail on our side. So I mean, that's where you just want to unlock the curiosity of our own minds and, and just be bolder, more innovative, take some risk. But it's not that big a risk, and have some fun.
To your credit, uh, have some fun, thank you. Um, we um, had an Okta Intel wearable summit here uh, a couple months ago, and there was six people, I think five people came from your technology group, and they, what they liked about it the most wasn't the startups that I had presenting up here about these new cool little things, but uh, when the one guy talked about beacons, there was a Walgreens exec here, McDonald's, United, Hyatt. During the breaks, they were all talking with each other. How are you using beacons? How's it going? So that cross-industry learning, I think it's amazing. Yeah, it, it is, and, and then you actually, what the interaction between the sectors, then technology starts to link that up. So if you're wearing a um, wearing a jawbone up like I am now, you know that will interact with a map my right and interact with Walgreens, and, and it'll stop. Everything is beginning to communicate, and and it doesn't necessarily have an immediate and obvious benefit to your business, but if it's making your customers' lives easier, then someone on the line you're going to get credit for that. They, they're going to relate to you and think about you in a different way than it just being a destination for your food and drink. So. It's how can you play a meaningful role? How can we, how can we utilize our contacts in the music industry, in the film industry, through the sports partnerships we have? How can we bring that to our customers in a way that they care about, they enjoy, and it means something to them, as well as the general question experience? Yeah. yeah, we look forward to leveraging some of that with you at 1871. So I heard another rumor. Uh, we'd like to get some news out here. Uh, you've got a secret R&D lab somewhere west of here. What, what's going on there? Anything cool you can tell us about? There's just friends, no one's writing anything down. Yeah. Well, it was secret until you told everyone. Yeah. Um, no, we have. We have. A, we call it an innovation center. It's it's a it's a it's an unbranded, but a, it's a, it's it's a huge warehouse down a fair fair way down I-55, and we use it as a um, it's a playground for us. It's a playground for ideas. So everything from we have. Um, very flexible, customizable kitchen layouts where each of our major countries from around the world will come in and will literally run their promotional programs and their menus through it to make sure that we have the, the operational capability. So fine tuning equipment positions and, and staffing and positioning, all that type of nuts and bolts stuff, all the way through to the innovative stuff. So we've got then if you like a futures area where we do access futures in technology and, 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 and start to play with it and just see how what sort of role that could play, or just learn from our own curiosity. Anything you can tell us about that we won't tell? Um, well, in, in the nearer term, it's, it's building out some of the concept that almost we're talking to now. Is that how can we how can we leverage the technology that exists today, from geolocation all the way through from from the mobile apps we're developing, how that interrelates with our, our ordering systems and with our point of sale into the, into the, the back of house stuff? How can? But at the end of the day, we want to prepare hotter, fresher, tastier food in ways that's more convenient, uh, more accessible, more engaging for customers. Um, and we still put the power of the experience more into their hands, other than us dictating the way they interact with us. So it's kind of playing on those types of sort of, I was down there last Friday actually for half a day with the team, and uh, you always come away and you, whenever you think you've stretched yourself into an uncomfortable place, the team down there puts you at a further level of discomfort as to they just stretch your thinking, and it's, 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 it really is mind expanding, it's fun. Yeah, there's a few large brands in the audience. I mean, they're not the largest restaurant in the world like you, but many things fall through the cracks when you have to build it at scale. So, and, and I appreciate the, the level you have to go out. Uh, let's talk about adjacent businesses real quick before we wrap up on uh, your passion, what keeps you going, which is, I was at Kraft yesterday, and mm -hmm. they told me some other news that I'm not supposed to know, uh, that you guys are launching a new product tomorrow, I think, at grocery stores yeah. uh, nationwide. Um, called McCafe? Yes, we're taking the McCafe product, so effectively the coffee product, into retail here in the US. Um, a couple of months ago we, we did a same deal with Kraft into, into Canada. And the idea is it's, it's, it's around brand extensions, but brand extensions with a, with a meaning and a purpose. So whilst customers, I mean coffee is very habitual and, and, and when they're on the move like yourself, you'll have a routine and you'll always want to grab your coffee at a certain point of the journey for instance. Um, it's also a habitual home drink as well. So I mean this is just a, an opportunity for us to get our brand into consumers' homes, get them enjoying the product, so whether it's ground coffee, whole bean coffee, decaf, and, and then we can start thinking about extending the beverage range if you like. Know, but this is craft. I mean one of the largest companies in the world. Why did they partner with you? I mean, they could have done it on their own. Yeah, they could. Um, I mean, one of the, um, one of the 
exciting aspects of McDonald's, which, which I don't want this to come across, is, is the scale we have and the reach we have, and our ability to convene some of the best partners. I mean, the reason Apple wanted us as a launch partner was because they wanted to be able to take their product, particularly Apple Pay, to, to up to 70 million people a day. And there aren't many businesses that offer that. And, and clearly McDonald's, because of our scale, does. The same with craft. You know, if, if you do want to go into the into, into the retail market, the grocery market, which clearly they do, they want to take one of the strongest, most recognised, incredible brands into that. So it works for them. It certainly works for us, and uh, we look forward to seeing that takes. I want to try some. Uh, there's a lot of since you mentioned Apple Pay, a lot of designers, developers, and audience from around the city. Um, how's that going? It's going really well, actually. I mean, it, it was it was a wonderful example for us to use. You talk about turnaround. Um, myself, Atif, and our IT guy were invited into a downtown hotel about eight weeks before the closed and all. And signing NDAs before we even knew what we were signing for and all the rest of that. So um, we, we duly assembled, we got into discussion and within eight weeks, eight to ten weeks I think it was, we went from that first meeting to the launch at Cupertino and had it rolled out across 14,000 restaurants. So I think for us, that's, that's, I want to use that as an example program. of what the, the art of the possible when you put your mind to it. And I'll tell you what made it possible. Only about 10 or 12 people in the entire McDonald's organisation knew before Tim Cook got on stage. Because we didn't take it through committees, we didn't take it through votes, we didn't take it through approvals, we didn't take a few of us had the opportunity to make the decisions. So unlike tonight, you can keep the secret, actually. Say that again, sorry? Unlike tonight, you can, oh, you can keep a secret. Well, when you're under NDA, yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sign well, incentive to keep a secret. Amazing. Well, it is, and, and you know, the, the reality is we will, be, we will have to work more often in that way, because when we're working with the sort of partners we are, confidentiality is critical. And if you blow it once, they're not going to come back and want to work with you again. For, so for us, it was a, a signal to ourselves internally that get used to this and to treat it as an exciting as an exciting event as opposed to why didn't I know type mentality. And, uh, I'd say it's a pretty good one to start with. It's, I mean, Silicon Valley, we call that stealth startups, and to see you do that, is, that's the best thing ever all night, seriously. Uh, just let's wrap up with some passion stuff. What, I mean, this, I just heard a ton of priorities, kind of an overwhelming set of things that you have to do as a management team. What's, uh, where you get your own personal inspiration from? Personally? Um, I think, first of all, it has to start from within. I mean, unless you're motivated yourself, then life's too much like hard work. Getting up every morning is too much like hard work, unless you're motivated and excited, and hopefully it comes across that I have. Um, my motivation at the moment is around knowing how it feels to turn the business around. I can't wait to have that feeling again. That's, that's the driver for me. I try and convey that with, with a sense of confidence of, of what is possible. I'm very glass half full on this. I do believe in the ability for our business to, to get traction and use the opportunities ahead to, uh, to, 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 to develop our next. And, I, and then the most motivating, motivating thing is seeing the looks on people's faces, seeing how it feels for people who are experiencing that around you, your teams around you who are pouring their hearts and souls into this stuff. They're reading the same sort of things in the papers you are. You know, the, the, the Fortune magazine is not lost on them. You know, this morning's news headlines is not lost on, on the team. There's a lot of pride, there's a lot of commitment, there's also an anxiety in it. And, you know, between all of us, I can't wait to lift, lift that mood for those guys and, uh, and have, have them uh, go back to their families and say, by the way, did you see the latest Fortune article on us? And, and it'll be, maybe it'll be a different headline. Yeah, it'll be good ones to follow. So what does keep you up at night? Is it like Chipotle, Panera, Five Guys, in and out Burger, Chick-fil-A? I mean, indigestion from going there, you mean? Is yeah. that what you're suggesting? Um, Can you imagine getting all those on a road trip? Or? No, um, I'm lucky. I sleep pretty well, so I, I don't really have a problem going to... I, I, it's... The, the, only, the only pressure I ever feel is, is what you put on yourself. It's, it's, you, you get, this is a chance and lifetime opportunity. And it, it, when you do have a chance and lifetime, you only get one crack at it. And I just want to make the most of it, for me personally, but really for the business. I mean, we've been 59 years, next year's our, our 60th. The business existed long before me and it'll exist long after me. All I know is it's got a window of time to make a difference. And the opportunity to make a difference in a business of the scale and the stature of McDonald's is, is an exciting opportunity. So that's, that's kind of my, my personal uh, modus operandi, if you like. That's what kind of gets me going. It's 
a great way to end. We really look forward to having you back in the year and hear, hearing how it goes. And uh, just before we end, um, we just want to give you a little token of our appreciation for the uh, Octa Innovation Series presentation of the logo. Oh, there you go.